The first person perspective in cinema is often used in action sequences, sometimes with the deliberate intention to immerse the viewer the way a first person shooter does. But these are very different mediums, and even in good movies, first person action sequences are often less legible and impactful than they would be if shot conventionally, when dealing with variables like camera shake, the actor's bodies moving, and so on. Sujo River from the year 2000 employs this perspective not for the sake of spectacle, but to bring the viewer closer to a very specific, authentic world, and the feelings of the story. Also, as with many films by Liu Yi, it invites subjective and metatextual readings. It's not a gimmick that ever feels one note or ill-conceived here. Take this early scene where our protagonist and narrator, a freelance videographer working in Shanghai, meets a new client. Uh, we know the videographer is an unreliable narrator prone to lying from the opening monologue. We also know he's been a filmmaker for a long time. In this meeting, the edit captures the essence of the client and how the videographer sees him. He has lofty ambitions he can't adequately explain, and he's a little pretentious. We get this from the actor's performance, but also how the editing style cuts him off doesn't let him finish his thoughts. The film itself, metatextually, is saying, Oh god, let me spare you from this guy. These kinds of clever tricks continue throughout the film, and help develop the videographer's character even though we never see him. Right up to a near fade to black cued with his voiceover later in the story that reverses itself when we can get another character's input. Though even that fade, in keeping with the film's documentary trappings, is partially achieved in world through a flickering light bulb, a central motif. The videographer's elusive and mysterious girlfriend Mei Mei wants a romance like one she heard in a story about a motorcycle courier named Mardar. Then suddenly we're in that very courier's story, learning of how he must reconcile developing romantic feelings for a young woman he's to abduct for ransom money. Her name is Mudan. Mudan, who very much resembles Mei Mei, is played by Zhou Zun, in a daring and brilliant double performance. Following events in the courier's life, we seem to step away from the videographer's perspective, even if the docudrama style remains, and it isn't always clear what he did and didn't photograph. Mudan has more agency, too, and the cinematic language becomes, in the biggest scare quotes ever, more conventional. The videographer is a separate character who has his own unreliable perception of events, the courier, and his plight. Sometimes we want Mardar and Mudan to exist outside the videographer's manipulation and perspective. Other times, we empathize with him. Mardar and Mudan's love story is almost more sympathetic in a way because it's shot conventionally. It's hard not to partially balk at the videographer character who has all this intimate footage of Mei Mei where he kisses and fondles her that reads as creepier at times because of his, and our, agency. But how different is that making of story than literally any famous romantic film you've ever seen? And before you write this off as a pretentious remote meta experiment, the movie is achingly alive, capturing Shanghai and its people in candid and beautiful fleeting moments, and unfurling its stories of love, loss, and identity with natural performances, and an affecting sense of wistful, nostalgic melancholy one might associate with Wong Kar Wai. Thanks to the gritty environment and the poetry of the story, Sujo River becomes a fascinating study of reality's coexistence with myth, and how we find self-definition through myth and media. The characters really all love versions of each other, highlighting our tendency to fall in love with stories, fantasies, and ideas of who we want people to be, or wish they were. Thanks to the videographer's character, it's also a self-reflexive examination of the filmmaker's role in perpetuating those very stories and myths, from an incredibly personal and subjective point of view. That the film's story has this vibe of being just one of many tales plucked from the seedier side of Shanghai, delivered in gritty docudrama photography, itself invites speculation on the line between fact and fiction, documentary and narrative. What do love stories do to people? How are we conditioned by them? How do they shape our ideas and expectations of love? Sujo River's suggestion is that the answers lie in a more critical reading and awareness of love stories in our culture, but also in turning our gaze inward.